try to address that with our students at the uh, freshman and sophomore level, at the junior and senior level, and even at the graduate level. We have graduate learning outcomes that are associated with social responsibility as well. So again, those are the four things that I see that kind of uh, distinctify that make social responsibility kind of unique as compared to some of the other uh, core objectives. And if there are others, uh, I would certainly invite you to uh, give us some information through the chat line. Or again, if you want to turn on your uh, mic and let us hear what you have to say, that would be awesome as well. Seeing none and hearing none, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Perkis, and she'll deal with our next topic. I think this is this is kind of all encompassing here, and we start with the word challenges. And I know when I started thinking about high impact um, practices in teacher education, we do a lot of differentiated learning. We're teaching our teachers to be um, teachers who can use differentiated strategies. And many of those differentiated strategies are these effective educational practices that are going to promote active student involvement in deeper learning. Um, I think that we found that um, definitely high impact um, practices are very beneficial for our student engagement and also for student engagement in learning, which is really important. Um, some of the challenges that I think many of us face is that if you've never done anything experiential is kind of knowing how to go about doing that and figuring it out for your own content area or for um, your classroom. And then also time constraints. There are many time constraints that we have at the university level, um, whether it's time constraints with how much time you actually get to spend with students, how much time they have um, to spend in um, activities and experiential pieces that are maybe outside of the class time. Um, and, I, I, and when I talk about my example later on, um, I tried several things as a Connect fellow um, and found that there were huge challenges for students um, during my first Connect class because I required them to do multiple hours outside of the classroom in, an, in, in various kinds of um, experiences. And, and it's when you're in an institution such as ours, where many of our students are non-traditional and um, they're, they're, they're working students, then um, it's a little, there are some challenges that you have to meet. So when we're talking about high impact um, educational practices, um, we have a list here of a number of things that I think um, the literature points to as being high impact co-curricular initiatives, obviously immersion experiences. Um, we are doing Connect classes this year with um, study abroad, where our students are abroad for four weeks and they're immersed in the culture um, and can't always do that in your classroom, although, again, as you'll see with my example in a little while, we do immerse our teacher ed students um, in a field experience for six weeks, and then, of course, we do it in clinical teaching, used to be called student teaching, but they're a part of the classroom for the whole semester. Um, leadership training, teaching our students to be leaders, and certainly adding um, to that the idea of what are the social responsibility pieces that, that go with being a leader. One of the things that we're trying at ASU, um, certainly in, in geology, the geology department has started um, a student learning community where they're bringing in groups of students um, together and keeping them as a cohort. And certainly um, cohorts working together, um, there are opportunities for learning, there are opportunities for those people, uh, for those students uh, to actually take on social responsibility, community-based interactions. Uh, senior capstone type experiences um, in teacher education, we call that clinical teaching in other, um, in other content areas. Um, many of the content areas have capstone experiences that are experiential. And we may not have thought about those classes as high impact practices. And the last one on the list, um, research with a faculty mentor, and we are certainly uh, moving to a lot, uh, moving towards a lot of undergraduate research. It's certainly um, 
beginning to become common practice um, at the undergraduate level. Real quick, just a point, uh, pointing back to our PowerPoint presentation there, the co-curricular initiatives. This is something that I'm going to address in my example. Dr. Perkis will deal with hers uh, first after we deal with these challenges, opportunities for learning. Uh, but I'll uh, come back, double back to that one and talk about co-curricular initiatives then. So I didn't want you to think that we had skipped that one. Oops, there we go. Oops. There we go. There we go. Um, as we move to this next slide, the, the next slide, this is actually, well, I think, one of the challenges um, of actually um, using social responsibility, and that's the measurement. How do you measure, how do you assess um, a student's uh, response to a class or an activity um, to get any kind of a feeling for whether or not the knowledge has seeped it, you know, really stuck and whether or not they can do it. We know in high impact practices, um, the more you do something, the, the better the knowledge is learned. So um, different types of authentic assessment here are really, I think, important um, for social responsibility learning because we are going to, you know, be measuring real world tasks um, and application. Um, and so it, it follows the authentic learning piece, if our, if our experiential activities are authentic, real world, contextual, then having an authentic assessment obviously um, fits the bill here. Dr. Carter already talked about having things that are quali qualitative. The reflections, um, performance-based uh, rubrics that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, I found in my work that reflections are some of the best ways as long as the prompt question, the, the prompt that you set it is a good prompt to really pull out what it is you're trying to find out. And, and as we said before, there's often not a, a, right, a wrong or a right answer. Every individual student is going to show you their level of understanding um, from what they've done through their experiences. So I think when we're talking about authentic assessment here for social responsibility, you have to um, provide different pathways that students um, can demonstrate um, their skills. Reflections is obviously one, um, observations, and then the whole idea of a portfolio where they can chronicle and keep um, what they've done and how they've done it is always a useful idea. The portfolio is a great tool for growth over time. So you can see how a, a student has kind of moved along in their understanding. A rubrics, best way, I think, to assess, um, because if you give a rubric up front to a student, they know exactly um, what's expected of them, and they can use their rubric to help show the extent of their performance and their um, ranges of learning. We have an example of the QEP rubric that we use for um, social responsibility. And so we, we tend to, I think, in teacher ed as well as with um, this particular rubric, we're using a, a, a four-column a, a four column design where you go from insufficient or incomplete to exemplary. And I think that um, Dr. Carter was going to talk a little bit about this rubric. Sure. Um, this is our, as Dr. Perkins said, our QEP rubric, our social responsibility that we're using for our program level assessment uh, of the QEP. Uh, this is the second iteration of this rubric, uh, and Dr. Perkis was involved in reviewing uh, the first iteration and the second iteration, so I think we both agree that this is a far superior rubric than our, our first stab at it, but it took us a year of, of actually using this rubric, uh, realizing it had uh, some deficiencies and, and then working to, to make it better. Uh, it is an adaptation of a couple of the value rubrics. Uh, of course, value is an acronym for valid assessment of undergraduate uh, learning, uh, undergraduate university learning, I guess. Uh, the two value rubrics that we used were the civic engagement uh, rubric and the intercultural competence rubric. 
again, it was based on our parsing of the, the state's definition of uh, social responsibility. Uh, we did make some changes broadly to the format. Uh, if you're familiar with the value rubrics, uh, they have levels that are like benchmark and milestone uh, that really don't speak, at least didn't speak to us in terms of, of uh, uh, how a student progressed from one level of achievement to the next. So uh, our one, two, three, four are of course identified as insufficient or incomplete for one, emerging for two, proficient and exemplary. And then you can see the language there. Um, it's certainly not per perfect, uh, but like any other rubric, once you kind of get comfortable with the rubric and have uh, evaluated, rated a number of student artifacts, you really don't refer back to the rubric very much. You're able to distinguish between a one, a two, a three, or a four uh, fairly quickly. Again, um, we use the, uh, the language from the state to parse this out. We created three broad student learning outcomes, SR1, intercultural competence, SR2, civic responsibility, and SR3, community engagement. And those are printed in red on this rubric. And then we identified two uh, indicators for each of those three criteria. So uh, SR 1.1 is intercultural awareness. Intercultural 2 is intercultural, excuse me, SR 1.2 is intercultural communication. And you can read through that uh, to see uh, what the expectations are for uh, our students on that. When I uh, and again, my example, you're going to see a different rubric at the end uh, that I use within uh, the confines of my class, uh, but eventually my student artifacts will be rolled up for program level assessment and, and all of those, regardless of whether they're in my class or someone else's class as part of our QEP, uh, will be viewed through the lens of this particular rubric. So moving on. I think next Dr. Perkis is going to talk about her particular example of teaching social responsibility. And, and this was an interesting kind of move for me. Um, I think when we started our QEP, I started out with the idea um, my first year of doing um, the Connect Fellowship that I wanted my students in my, I teach science methods, so I wanted my students in the science methods class to be connected um, to local um, organizations and so that they could kind of be um, more involved in the community. And so I started off with a community involvement piece and it, it, it was really good the first semester um, and there are always challenges when you do this kind of thing. First semester I only had 30 students. It was great. I placed them with Texas Parks and Wildlife, with the Water Center here. We had um, educational ambassadors in one of the schools, we were doing math and science nights, and so all of the students could be involved. The next semester I had 60. And so I went from, you know, being able to place 10 people at Parks and Wildlife and 10 people here. Um, I had nowhere to place people because I had so many. And we really had to kind of, we managed to get through the semester, but at the end of the semester I really had to think about, you know, what was I trying to do with my Connect project? Um, and it was really all about kind of social responsibility and taking part in your community. Um, and, and, and then I had this big light bulb go off. Um, my students are out in the field six weeks every semester. They're doing field experiences um, in the classroom. And so why not Connect? Great word. Um, my, what was going on, what we were doing already with the idea of our Connect QEP. And the first thing I had to tell myself is that teaching social responsibility is not a core skill. Um, you know, my, my seniors still needed to make that connection between what they were going to do for a living, teaching, um, with this idea of, of being socially responsible. And so in, in, in teacher education, I came up with these two facets the teaching for social responsibility. And the first one was making sure that my pre-service teachers were actually um, socially responsible themselves and that when they started teaching, they could include social responsibility in their lesson plannings and in their um, teaching field experiences. So 
um, we tried very um, diligently in my class to develop a democratic community of learners. Um, and, and, and there are, um, Apple and Bean wrote a great book about um, democratic schools some years ago. Um, and the idea of using democratic processes within your classroom. And so I picked up on several um, democratic activities. Um, Jigsaw, which is a cooperative learning strategy using collaboration. Um, dialogue and debate um, were huge in my class, um, as well as experiential um, high impact pieces. We did a lot of experiential hands-on learning, um, no textbook in this class. And so um, we talked about teaching um, how to solve conflict. Because again, when you're teaching children, conflicts are going to arise. And so by using examples of my pre-service teachers being in groups, we could talk about what conflicts arose when you tried to arrange um, you know, a group project or a group field experience um, and address those controversial issues that came up. And you know, we're talking about senior level students, but also trying to get them to understand that these kinds of things are going to happen in first grade. And controversial issues may not be the same level, but if we can teach them, teach our pre-service teachers how to do this, then they're going to be able to teach their students as well. And so it's kind of um, learning by doing and, and teaching by doing. So we asked some essential questions um, to promote dialogue in the classroom. Um, what do they know and what they don't know is really important, um, especially with social responsibility. You know, what do you understand when you don't understand? And then why, what, who, and where? When, when the questions start, you know, what are all the parts of um, an essential question? And then digging deeper for more critical thinking. So when we're trying to address controversial issues, when we're trying to solve conflicts, we have um, parts of our dialogue that we can understand. Um, and use um, not only for what we're doing ourselves, but also for our teaching. That's backwards. Backwards. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. So, um, you know, teaching, teaching how to include social responsibility involves several things in, in teacher ed classes. The first is, of course, lesson plans. Um, our teachers do extensive lesson plans, and so having them use socially responsible topics like uh, recycling, um, use of manufactured uh, materials, um, the idea of water conservation, the idea of things like deforestation. Um, we try to use those. Um, and again, I, I teach elementary in 4-8, so um, we're doing this on a very um, young level. But um, the younger students start to learn about social responsibility, the better. Um, so we aligned our topics, obviously, all the topics that we were using in the classroom to our state standards. They're called the TEAPs. And then I always use a model of inquiry-based science, which is the 5E model, and that's on here. So we have kids that engage and then um, explore, come up with an explanation, elaborate, and then evaluate. And I think the elaborate piece here is really important for um, both my students who are learning how to be teachers and then for the children that they're teaching because they're using social responsibility as a key for their lesson planning. And um, they also, I think, develop a much deeper understanding of their place by using topics, um, social responsible topics. Recycling is the key one. Use of water, certainly in our part of the state, is also another one. So understanding what happens in the water cycle and what happens why we're conserving water and those types of things are automatically including social responsibility into their lesson plans. And then hopefully um, they get to teach these lesson plans and so in their uh, field experience as well. So we do lesson plans, and we also do field experience. So they take up their lesson plans that are you know, including social responsibility topics and actually teaching these in um, small groups um, in the classroom. Um, and at the same time as they're teaching, they're also viewing or observing the role of the teacher in the classroom and how the teacher in the classroom acts as an agent of social responsibility. Um, and it's really interesting um, in some of their reflections 
what they talk about that they see actually going on in the classroom. And so they talk about, well, the teacher doesn't recycle any paper. They don't have recycle boxes or they don't have, um, you know, a, a box for putting plastic water bottles and things like this. And so um, they see that as an important aspect of what a teacher should be teaching. Even though it's something that they do, the students, the, the, the um, elementary students, are actually seeing adults taking on the role of being socially responsible. Um, and what, what better way to learn than from a very good model? And so um, I'm hoping, certainly through the field experience, and I, I actually think this really does work, is that um, the, the elementary students are discovering social responsibility through the lesson planning. And then my pre-service teachers are also understanding their role as an agent of social responsibility. Um, and then I always have my students reflect. They reflect on the classroom. Um, teachers' attitudes and actions about social responsibility and also on the students. So I think the next slide is actually an example. This is, um, I want to key in uh, on, on question number four. We do a, a, a pre and post reflection. We do a, a, a pre reflection on their teaching, you know, how the teaching went the first time, and then we do this reflection number two at the very end. Um, and I'm very pointed with question number four about asking them um, what they've learned about civic and social responsibility and, and whether or not they think um, the teachers have these kinds of responsibilities and are they important and, and how did the school that our pre-service teachers work in benefit from um, their involvement in their community. And the next one, uh, the next one, yes, it's a big one, but um, when you get down to um, the paragraph, it's the fourth paragraph that says, I truly believe that teachers, um, that teachers have social responsibility, um, that I think, I think it should be show social responsibility to students because we're potentially bettering their futures and the futures of others. We have a duty to provide them a quality education and provide them for what comes. Social responsibility is, a, is in sorts a type of benefit to the society at large. So they really are kind of reflecting on that question um, at the end of their teaching. And um, I have noticed that these guys go on to a clinical teaching that used to be called student teaching. And I've noticed in some of the reflections from student teaching that they still hold that idea of um, using some social responsibility lessons and teaching kids, that it really is important. Um, to recycle and do those kinds of things in the classroom. So we started with two facets of teaching for social responsibility. Hopefully the outcome and, and the beginning teachers who understand their own social responsibility and can teach those K-8 students with understanding. And so, you know, passing on their own understanding of social responsibility through the topics they teach and the way that they teach those topics um, to enrich K-8 students. You know, the whole idea here of social responsibility is to make the world a better place to live in. And if we can pass on that understanding, I think that's an important piece um, of what we do in um, teacher education. Okay, does anyone have any questions? We're going to pause here just a second. And again, if you want to use your chat function, type a question in. Uh, we'll try to address this before we move on to the the second example that we want to highlight today. Okay, we'll move on then. Uh, the second example is one that, uh, that I use in one of my classes and the reason that I include it here is uh, it's one that I use to help our faculty understand how easy this can be. Uh, as Dr. Perkis mentioned, there are some challenges when you try to uh, administer a community engagement kind of uh, activity in terms of uh, the administrative time and effort that goes into that on your part. And as she, she said, uh, she came to the, the conclusion that, you know, why am I going through all of this anguish when we're already connecting our students through a field experience in, in, in the course that's already required in the course. And so that's kind of the genesis of this. Try to find those things that your students may already be doing and uh, turn it into a learning activity. 
uh, turning it turn it into a way of not only the students learning but for them to be able to write about and demonstrate what they're learning and so uh, a co-curriculum broadly is something that uh, walks alongside the more formal formal curriculum it is still a way in which students learn and in most cases it's a way students learn through doing uh, and going back to social responsibility, it is a behavior, it is a skill, it's something that we have to do, something that we have to practice, and it can take some time uh, to develop. So the bulleted page that you see in front of you there are some of the, the rationale behind uh, these co-curricular connections. And, and while it does take a little bit of uh, ingenuity or creativity on your part to, to set this up, in most cases, I think within your discipline, you're going to be able to find a co-curricular activity that's either directly related to your discipline or something that's generic enough, like volunteerism or you know doing something for the good of the community uh, that uh, students can organize on their own. We're fortunate here at ASU uh, that we have uh, a Center for Student Involvement and they make students aware of volunteer activities all across the city. Uh, and some of those, of course, are next door to the campus, and some of them are across town. And so regardless of whether a student has transportation available to them or not, there are going to be opportunities for them to do that. Uh, there are opportunities like that on campus uh, where they don't even have to have any kind of transportation. Uh, the same thing applies uh, to the activity that you're going to see from me. Uh, in, in my Connect activity, in my uh, co-curricular connection activity, we're expecting students to learn from their physical activity. Uh, most of our majors are involved in some kind of physical activity program. Uh, in fact, that is one of our department's uh, core values, that we live physically active lifestyles. So we expect students to do these things, uh, and we expect them to learn from them, not just become physically fit, but to actually learn and be better citizens, be more socially responsible uh, as a result of that. So again, uh, back to the PowerPoint, you see those first several bullets talking about the, uh, the advantages of or the, uh, the ways that this co-curricular connection uh, can fit into uh, something that's useful to you. The last bullet talks about uh, the assessment. Uh, and I want to talk just briefly about scaffolding. Uh, and you'll see the scaffolding as, as my, uh, my, my assignment artifacts lay out. Uh, scaffolding that I do for this is in the form of a, a proposal, a progress report, and then a summative reflection. And all three of those are writing assignments. And I don't know about your students, but writing is not one of the uh, one of the strong suits of, of the students that generally are in my classes. I have exceptional writers, uh, but by and large, I have average to poor writers. And again, maybe I'm being simple-minded here, but it's my belief that you're not going to become a better writer unless you practice. And so these uh, reports these reflections give them an opportunity to practice their writing uh, while they're also demonstrating what they've learned about, uh, in our case, an integration of social development along with their motor or physical development. So the next three slides, actually next five slides, uh, outline my assignment. So uh, the first slide is uh, just an overview of the assignment. This is something that is communicated to the students at the beginning of the course. I teach this. This is an online course. And so this assignment is posted for them in uh, Blackboard, uh, our course management system. Uh, then early in the semester, they have to create a proposal. What is it they plan to do? About halfway through the semester, they have to submit a progress report. And then, of course, towards the end of the semester, a reflection of uh, their activity. And then last but not least, the last artifact is the rubric that I use for this particular assignment in my course. So here's the, the uh, document that I post in Blackboard that outlines the assignment. 
And again, this is particular to kinesiology, but I do believe that you can find a co-curricular activity uh, that takes place on your campus that would fit for you and your course uh, for your discipline. And again, our students are expected to be physically active, so we have them participate in a physical activity throughout the semester. They're probably already doing that anyway. And so instead of them just doing that as a diversion, let's do it as a learning activity. And so right in the middle of that page, you see the more common things that students uh, can participate in or choose to participate in. Uh, but there's always that catch-all other. And so if they want to do something other than those things that are uh, listed there, uh, they simply write up their pro proposal like anyone else would. Uh, and if I see it as being sufficient, I will certainly approve that. Uh, this course is motor development. Uh, like education, we're all about human development. This focuses on uh, the motor development of humans. Uh, but you can't talk about motor development in a vacuum. You have to understand how we as humans develop socially and intellectually, uh, physically, and then, of course, uh, our movement skills. Uh, there is a chapter in the textbook that we use on social development. Uh, so that was my end, so to speak, to uh, address social development uh, through this assignment, or at least the integration of social development along with their motor development uh, and physical development. The next three slides, I think you can easily see how this assignment scaffolds itself. Uh, first is a very simple proposal where they briefly dis describe the physical activity that uh, they propose to be involved in throughout the semester, um, who they're going to be participating with, and then what their role in the activity is. Uh, Dr. Perkish talked about the pre-service teacher observing their supervising teacher and often comment that maybe that supervising teacher isn't recycling paper, I think was the example that she used, like uh, that the student believes she, she should. And so if they are being led by somebody else, I want them to write about what they see the leader doing in terms of his or her social responsibility. If they are the leader, if they propose that their physical activity is out in the community coaching a Little League baseball team, then I want them to talk about how they're demonstrating social responsibility. And then last but not least, and of course, uh, we want them to be able to reflect at the end on what they hope to accomplish at the beginning. And so we have them state what their goals are at the beginning, both physically and socially. Uh, as as a result of their involvement in this physical activity program. Progress report, we have them go back and briefly describe what they've been doing and what they, again, hope to accomplish in the remainder of their time period, and then start to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, three additional prompts uh, that you see there on the progress report. And then by the time we get to the reflection paper at the end, We've added uh, two more prompts. Again, I, I don't think our students are that much different than most of your students. If we just had them reflect on this at the end, uh, if it was due tomorrow, uh, and in fact, uh, in my summer class, this reflection paper is due tomorrow, I believe, uh, because our final exams are uh, Wednesday, um, they might be staring at a blank page for a long time with not much uh, in their uh, pocketbook in terms of uh, what to write. By scaffolding this assignment, by giving them a progress, by giving them a proposal, a progress report, at least they have that much somewhat written. Uh, and they don't have a blank page to stare at uh, at the end of the semester. Uh, the, the, the first two assignments uh, uh, don't carry as much weight in terms of their grade whereas this one is equivalent to a test grade. And so this helps them to get from point A to point B with some intermediate steps rather than one big step at the end. Now, this is still a work in progress. This, I believe, is the third year that I've used this. Uh, these prompts need to be revisited and improved. Um, Dr. Perkins and I did a presentation about, I guess, nine months ago uh, on the importance of prompts. 
and the students are not going to be able to write good reflections unless you can write good prompts. And it's like good test questions. And so uh, I, I see some weaknesses in these prompts, some lack of clarity. Uh, there's some outs. Students may not have to demonstrate their social responsibility as well as they should uh, based on the, the quality of, of the prompts that I provide to them. So those prompts are key if you're going to have students demonstrate what they've learned uh, in a, a field-based setting um, that's basically outside the confines of, of the classroom, which, of course, this certainly is. Last but not least, this is the rubric, a very simple rubric that I use for this assignment. And this is a copy of the rubric out of Blackboard. You can create a PDF, as most of you know, uh, from your Blackboard rubrics. <coughs> And as you can see, there are three indicators on this rubric. Uh, it is a written assignment, and so 40% of the grade is going to be determined by how well, how well they write. Again, nothing special about uh, those, uh, those levels of achievement there. To get 100%, they have to demonstrate that they can write without any flaws in grammar, clarity, and or organization. That's not very descript, uh, but uh, it, uh, it's amazing. Uh, how that does help some students, especially when you give them some feedback on those first two assignments. Then uh, the next two indicators are pulled right off of that social responsibility rubric that we introduced to you at the beginning of this presentation. Uh, these two are about their ability to engage with the local community, uh, which for us is SR3 the ability to effectively engage in the local, regional, national, global communities. And so as I indicated earlier, we've got two indicators of social responsibility, connecting engagement and content knowledge. We want them to, uh, we want what they do outside the class to inform what they do inside the class and vice versa. It's a, basically a two-way street here. And then the reflection piece. Uh, we want them to be reflective professionals. Uh, we want them to go out in the world and do a good job today, but then be able to say, well, what did I do today that I could do better tomorrow? And so we want them to start thinking about their thinking, thinking about their actions. Uh, and if they can do that and write about that, uh, then uh, we're, we're helping them be responsible citizens in their jobs. Um, Anytime you do reflection, it's going to, well, the student's ability to demonstrate what they've learned through a reflective piece is going to be dependent somewhat on how well they can express themselves uh, in the written word. And so, as I say, some of our students don't write very well, uh, and therefore not only do they get dinged on their written communication skills, that negatively affects their ability to demonstrate what they learned about social responsibility as well. Uh, but uh, again, it gives them at least one more opportunity to practice, uh, gets them out, and while they may not be able to express what they've learned, they are learning. And when we can take these co-curricular activities and turn them into something besides, and not the diversion, not that a diversion is not important, but go beyond just a diversion from their studies to being a more integral part of uh, the undergraduate or the graduate education, uh, then I think we've, uh, we've accomplished something there. So that's my example. And uh, the next thing I want to make you aware of is uh, some of the resources that are available to you, not only Texas resources, uh, but some national resources as well. Uh, we do want to leave some time for some questions, uh, so I'm going to run through these relatively quickly. Uh, but I've got two links there to uh, your LEAP resources. One is to the LEAP homepage, uh, and from there you can navigate to a lot of different places, a lot of great resources that are available to you. Uh, if you aren't uh, a member of the LEAP listserv, there is a way of you uh, connecting to that, subscribing to that listserv, and so I would certainly encourage you to do that. And then, of 
course, bookmark this page so that you can go back and uh, see the way that this page has been updated. Let me go ahead and click on this. I think it's going to come in right on top of our PowerPoint. Yep, here it comes. And so here's our Leap Texas webpage. And uh, from there, of course, you can go lots and lots of different places, uh, including uh, the one that I have highlighted here. Under core objectives, we have resources posted now uh, for two core objectives. This past spring, we posted a lot of information relative to teamwork, and now we're beginning to build uh, some resources relative to social responsibility. So the second link back on our PowerPoint takes us here to the social responsibility page. And so here, kind of a commercial, uh, outlines the activities for Social Responsibility Week. And so today is the first uh, web-based event for Social Responsibility Week, this, this live webinar. This will eventually be posted. Uh, but tomorrow, uh, you, when you click here to see details of the program, then you'll see that tomorrow uh, we have a uh, social responsibility recipe that's all day with Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Edwards on Twitter. So uh, get your cell phones or your mobile device out, get on Twitter, and uh, engage with Dr. Edwards uh, on your social responsibility uh, recipe or cookbook. Wednesday, another event. Thursday and Friday, other events as well. So lots of really good resources available to you there on uh, the Leap Texas website. As I mentioned, a couple of national uh, resources to make available to you. The first one is the AACNU Faculty Collaboratives page. Uh, Leap Texas is part of this faculty collaborative projects, and so the link here will take you to that uh, so that you can learn more about the faculty collaboratives project. Uh, but I would also encourage you, if you're interested in learning more about Leap, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but right under the the, the LEAP logo there on the right side, uh, there's a little blue box that says learn more about LEAP. LEAP is an acronym for Liberal Education in America's Promise. And so uh, value rubrics, essential learning outcomes, signature assignments, uh, lots of information that might be beneficial to you uh, by getting on the AACNU webpage, uh, going to LEAP and learning more about that. And then last but not least, I want to make you aware of the NIOLA Assignment Library. NIOLA is the National Institute uh, for Learning Outcome Assessment. I think I have that transposed there. It should be NIOLA instead of NIOLA. Well, anyway, there's an assignment library. And when we click on that, that'll take you to what's called the DQP Assignment Library. This is, this is funded by Lumina and is aligned with the degree qualifications profile. Uh, but there's a lot of overlap between the DQP and the essential learning outcomes, which is uh, where our core curriculum, our core objectives derived. And so uh, this can be searched by academic discipline or assignment characteristics. It can be searched by DQP proficiencies. These are some of those learning outcomes or uh, the proficiencies that uh, undergraduates, master's level students should develop. And then, of course, you can search by level, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, or master's degree. So, for instance, if you're interested in some kind of, um, let's just look at the life sciences. If you're a life sciences uh, professor, there are two assignments there. Uh, that would be example assignments, kind of like what Dr. Perkins and I did today, that you might be able to adapt uh, to your course. And of course, you can see tags over there on the right uh, that might help you infuse these particular activities into that course. So uh, this is a, a great tool uh, and one that I certainly would encourage you to navigate to. Uh, you as a professor or sometimes like our students, here it is, you know, a week before the semester starts, and what am I going to do that fourth week of class? Oh, I know where I can go to figure out something to do. I could go to this DQP assignment library and adapt something from them rather than try to 
reinvent the wheel yourself. So again, some statewide and some, some national resources uh, that might be of interest to you. Last but not least, here is our contact information, our, our email address, and our phone number. And so if you do have questions, if there's something that uh, you'd like to know a little bit more about, please don't hesitate to contact us. We'll be glad to help you any way we can. Uh, again, we've tried to give you some examples of things, even though they're specific to our disciplines, at least the way we do them. We think they're generic enough or there's some uh, some insights there that you can use regardless of what you're teaching. So we've got about two minutes before four, uh, but I think both of us are willing to stay here and answer any questions that anyone would like to post on the webinar. Uh, and if not, then we'll sign off and, and uh, again, look forward to uh, interacting with you via email or a phone call, whatever the case may be. Thank you very much.